Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, there's a bit of room left there at the back. We've got a big crowd here tonight. Um, uh, uh, welcome to uh, Politics in the Pub tonight with John Hewson. Before we begin tonight's proceeding, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners on the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay respect to their elders, both past and present. I extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in attendance today. Thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Ben Oquist, I'm Executive Director of the Australia Institute, a think tank here in Canberra, and I'll be your MC for this evening. I'm particularly delighted uh, that the former leader of the Liberal Party um, launched Climate of the Nation in Parliament House today, and he's come here to join us tonight. So would you please welcome uh, John Hewson. Thank you. John, um, I wanted to ask you, um, having launched Climate of the Nation today, uh, and obviously across the report, and seen what, how so much of the Australian population wants action on climate change, such overwhelming findings, what's going wrong? I think everyone in the government has got a tin ear. <laughs> As Ben said, I've been involved in this issue since the early, early uh, 90s. Uh, in the package that I took to the 93 election, we had a very substantive environment policy, <laughs> which I'm sure nobody read. <laughs> they, they got distracted on the GST or something else, but um, <laughs> uh, you know, it, and it called for a 20% cut in emissions by the year 2000. We did think everything in terms of what would we were aiming to do in 10 years' time. We had some strategic thinking behind all the policies we developed. But a 20% cut in emissions by the year 2000 off a 1990 base. And today we're waiting for the explanation for a 5% cut in emissions by 2020 off a 2000 base. And of course we have the, the Paris commitments of 26 to 28% reduction in emissions by 2030, which is about half what it should be if we want to get to net zero emissions by 2050. But even so, we have no idea how the government would actually take us down that pathway, that transition to 2030. And today, of course, they took an even further step backwards <laughs> by, by canning the neg, even though that was in the end the fourth best solution. My God, as an economist, you know, we had a chance to have an emissions trading scheme several times that went by the boards. Uh, various attempts by both sides, I guess, and politics on that. Then an emissions intensity scheme, and then the Finkel recommendation for a clean energy target, and finally let's go for the fourth best, the NEG. And you know, can you believe it? Turnbull actually got party room of support for the NEG on two occasions. Yeah, overwhelming stakeholder support right across the power industry, right across the business community, broadly across civil society. You know, overwhelming evidence that this is what people wanted to see. Let's get, get on with it. And, and today they decide to put the neg on the back burner, not, not to pursue it. And in fact, they won't talk about emissions reduction anymore. Now, it's, it's, to me, that's just grossly irresponsible, apart from anything else. And, uh, you know, it just leaves me cold to imagine that they are ignoring voters. And I think you'll see that now carry through to the election as a significant issue, the next federal election. It'll probably be an election in the two state elections, an uh, issue, I should say, in the two state elections in November for Victoria and March for New South Wales. But most pressingly for, for poor old Morrison is that we have a, a by-election in my old seat of Wentworth on the 20th of October now. And I suspect that will be a big issue in that seat. And I uh, was fascinated by how fickle the seat was, how easy it would change, uh, and um, how uh, there was a very significant, what we'd call a green element in that seat, but a strong independent running on climate and other issues, getting a protest vote against the Liberal Party could win that seat. So I wouldn't be too complacent. To, I know the Liberal Party's pre-selecting their candidate tonight, but it's more likely to be a, an issue as to which independent decides to run. <coughs> And if in that independent not only sort of points to the failures of the Liberal Party in trying to change leaders in midstream, but also uh, focuses on climate, I think you'll see a very interesting outcome. It could the government could lose that seat and lose its majority in the parliament. 
Um, there are people in that seat that I dealt a lot with over the years who were very active in the 80s on the Franklin Dam case, for example. In fact, a lot of them would say they determined the outcome. Um, Bob Brown would probably balk at that. Um, Bob Hawke might want to take offence mm -hmm. from that. But there, that's the sentiment that uh, exists in a large part of the seat on a green issue, a significant green issue. So in that sense, I think um, uh, the government's been playing with fire today by backing off what is overwhelmingly supported by a clear majority, 70 plus percent of the community want decisive action by government on climate change. They certainly want to see more renewables. I think that Lowy Institute survey recently, 84% of those polled wanted more renewables. Um, and um, you know, in some cases they're happy to wear that even if it costs more, but it doesn't cost more anymore. Renewables are now cheaper than a new coal-fired power station. And although um, the Liberal Party flirts with the idea of another, you know, developing a new coal-fired power station, the ultra super critical, you know, coal-fired power station that they've got in, uh, that they're building in Japan, which, by the way, I heard early on that uh, some of our coal can't burn in that because it doesn't have the right fusion temperature, but we won't let those details get in the way. We could import coal for that purpose, why not? <laughs> you know, it's a nonsense argument. It won't get built, the financial community won't fund it. Uh, the insurance community recently has come out, uh, AXA, for example, has said that they won't insure any new coal-fired power stations anywhere in the world. So go ahead and build it, you know. Um, and uh, I'm fascinated just on a related issue that you mentioned about coal, but we know the overwhelming argument on coal that uh, just in the known reserves of coal to meet the, tar the Paris objectives, about 70% of the known reserves could never be dug and burnt. Uh, if we were to meet that Paris objective by 2050. Uh, so no new coal mine seems a pretty logical position to take. And so I'm fascinated at the debate about Adani, you know. And the nature of that debate has changed so many times as the justification has changed, you know. Originally we were going to export our coal to India to deal with the poor who don't get access to electricity. Then we find out they're actually not going to sell the coal in India because they don't want it anymore. They're transitioning quite quickly towards renewables, so they're going to sell it to Bangladesh and Pakistan or somewhere at an inflated price. And then they can't get financed. 25 or 30 major banks won't finance it. Palaszczuk's won an election by arguing the Adani case, against the Adani case. Said she wouldn't sign off on the Northern Australia infrastructure facilities supporting the rail link. You know, I don't know whether you know much about Adani, but it's, it's a couple of hundred kilometres inland on the other side of the Great Divide. You don't only have to build the mine, you've got to get the coal over the Great Divide and a new rail link. And the coal would go out through uh, Abbott Point, which would need to be expanded at the expense of the reef. So I can see a lot of <laughs> boxes in there that you can't tick. Uh, and uh, yet the debate persists. Nobody will come out and actually say at the political level, both sides, that this should not go ahead. And uh, they're still flirting with the idea of how can we fund it? Um, whether it's the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility or some other mechanism. The same thinking on coal. You know, I had a press secretary once who ended up Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, who thought coal was good for humanity. <laughs> and then Morrison turned up in Parliament with a lump of coal. <laughs> it just shows you how demented they really are, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> John, why do you think uh, the conservative side of politics, um, a journalist told me the other day I shouldn't call it the conservative side, I should call it the right side because there's nothing much conservative about them. Have nothing found... much right either. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, have found it so difficult to tackle the climate change issue in Australia. Is there something unique about the right or conservatives in Australia that has made it so much more difficult here than in some other countries? Well, it's interesting. We've lost a whole series of leaders, prime ministers, over the climate issue. I mean, Howard really, one of the real reasons he lost was that he wasn't prepared to sign or ratify the Kyoto Protocol and made it easy for Rudd to say, I'll sign it. Like he said, I'll say sorry, when Howard said, no, I won't say sorry, and I'm, so I'm not sorry. Uh, those sort of positions, which became very stubborn positions, I think were fundamental to his uh, demise. He not only lost his seat, but lost government. But Gillard uh, Rudd himself didn't have a great success with, um, with climate. 
when he started with a, great, uh, with a great capacity, I met him a couple of times and he had a very clear agenda. You know, he was going to ratify Kyoto, then he was going to have the Green Paper, the Ghana Report, the White Paper, go to the legislation, and if I can't get the legislation through the Parliament, uh, I will dissolve both Houses of Parliament and I'll push it through. And I think if he had have done that in two, February 2010, if he had have stuck with that agenda, because the Parliament wasn't supporting it, uh, even though he got beaten up a bit at Copenhagen, if he'd stuck with that agenda, he would probably still be Prime Minister, heaven forbid. But I mean, <laughs> I think he lost an opportunity, but it was the basis for him losing, Gillard replacing him, and Gillard changed their mind, because I'm no, no government I lead to put a price on carbon, then of course you put a price on carbon and mess the introduction of that. And Abbott had a bit of a field day then, being able to go all over the country, um, um, you know, running a scare campaign. I mean, Julia announced that decision to reverse her pre-election commitment, I think in February of that year, but she didn't say anything more about it until July. I thought she might have tried to build the case, you know, link the science to the need for response, lay out the options, this is why we're doing what we're doing, why we're doing it, um, this is what we hope to achieve, this is why there's an imperative. She said nothing. So Abbott went all over the country making all sorts of outrageous claims, you know, about why Allah would close and women would become barren and your hair would fall out or whatever. <laughs> he got away with any sort of argument which was totally unquestioned by the Labor Party and she finally announced the detail in June and put the wrong price on it. Put a fixed price of $23 when the European price was probably about six bucks and of course that created its own problem. But Abbott then thinks he wins the election on the basis of his opposition to the carbon tax so he comes in and he abolishes it and uh, then he didn't last. Turnbull came in with a great flourish. Everyone expected he'd do something substantive on climate. He didn't. So we had a succession of leaders that have lost their job. And that's the background, I think, to the question you've just asked about the Conservatives. Now, I don't like labels at all. Because, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I hear right and left and Conservative, progressive. People ask me what I am. I hate putting a label on it. I mean, I guess I was, in that sense, a small L liberal in a large L liberal party. But I don't like those labels because I've you know, read all the, the, uh, the sources and the writers in all those areas and I pick what I liked. Um, you know, you, most people are complex and they're not narrow in their thinking, but uh, particularly narrow in their thinking, although some of the conservatives act as if this is a true conservative position to oppose the science, to oppose climate, and to, and to uh, you know, now end up with a very socialist position trying to regulate the power companies. A uh, very not odd position for a Conservative to hold. I mean, I remember Howard gave a speech to the Climate Deniers Group in London, which was run by Nigel Lawson, who I've actually debated here in Australia on climate. I don't think he's extreme as, as extreme as, uh, as some of the others that uh, go under that banner, as climate deniers or climate sceptics. But Howard made a speech there where he openly admitted he'd played short-term politics with climate. He said, when it suited him, he would, have support, he would support decisive action on climate. And there were times where he looked at a renewable energy target or emissions trading schemes and so on. But when it didn't suit him politically, he opposed it. And then he made an most amazing statement uh, as a representative of the so-called right, is that he thought in the end uh, he remained, he said, a, uh, an agnostic when it came to climate, and he preferred to rely on his instincts. <laughs> now, it's not a question of religion, it's a question of science. And the science is overwhelming. 97% of pure says climate scientists say it's an important, urgent issue to be dealt with. And, you know, as non-climate scientists, we should take their view, I reckon. They've got, a, they've got that. It's an unusual thing for scientists to agree on anything. Because right? the nature of science is you disagree. You know, you put up your hypotheses, you test each other's, contest each other's hypotheses, you contest each other's research conclusions. Uh, so it is a question of science. And then when it comes to Howard's instincts, well, I worked for him for seven years as a chief advisor. Didn't like his instincts. <laughs> when he worked for me, I certainly didn't like his instincts, one of which was to get rid of me. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it's about getting the most cost-effective and sensible reaction. And so if you were a true conservative today, if you were genuinely conservative, if you believe, as they would claim to do, in um, in sort of... Change, avoiding change, unnecessary change, let's say, always in favour of smaller government, uh, less regulation, right? 
and uh, relying wherever possible on market processes and market forces. If you're a true conservative, you'd have an emissions trading scheme. You put a price on carbon and you get out of the way and let it happen. And when you don't do that and you still want to meet some sort of objectives, you end up doing silly things like we'll regulate the, the power companies or we'll have a royal commission into the power companies. People don't like power companies because they don't like banks. We'll have another royal commission. Not deal with the issue. And uh, so the conservative position, I think, is indefensible as they sell it as a conservative position. And it's not conservative. Well, it's it very socialist. It's very, um, you know, left. <laughs> not right. Well, this is kind of leading to my next question. John, what would you do if you were Prime Minister today? I mean, apart from firing the entire Cabinet <laughs> <laughs> and starting again. <laughs> um, look, I think that the electorate is looking, as that uh, our, um, study today, our survey today shows, the electorate's looking for leadership. And they are prepared, I think, to wear um, the truth. And if uh, somebody were to be pre prepared to stand up and lead on this issue, okay, set out what needs to be done, what sort of transition we're going to have to make in order to get to the sort of Paris objectives by 2030, uh, the pluses and minuses, be quite open about potential winners and losers, transition difficulties, facilitating transitions, maybe uh, including some financial support, including some... some um, Training, support, so on, you know. Um, there's a, a lot that a government could do by setting a clear sense of direction and backing it up with the relevant policy initiatives. And, you know, I used to say in the Turnbull days that Malcolm needed to do what people expected him to do. They wanted him to lead. He came in with enormous expectations. And I have the view that, as I said many times, if he'd actually said, I am going to lead on this issue, I'm going to set a clear-cut agenda, and to take you with me. I'm going to explain to you the nature of the problem. I'm going to set out the options for dealing with it. I'm going to pick an option. I'm going to fight for it. Day in, day out. Not only would the electorate have been enormously surprised that he actually delivered what he said, but he would, they would have cut him a lot of slack. And now I think the electorate's looking for leadership on this, and I think the pathway is pretty clear. And the tragedy, from my point of view, is and I'll go back to what I said in the early 90s. I mean, if we'd moved to an emissions trading scheme with those sort of objectives over the 2000s, over, over 1990s, just imagine where we'd be today. How many more billions of dollars worth of investment, uh, hundreds probably of thousands of jobs, uh, certainly a significantly stronger economic growth performance, uh, all of which has been squandered by short-term politics. We've lost those opportunities. In this country, we have an abundance of wind and solar resource. We have the technology, particularly solar thermal type technologies, but with storage, solar wind and solar PV and wind with storage. We have all that capacity in this country. We could have led the world for the last 25 or 30 years. And this is a tragedy to me that we didn't do that. Now, if you can't sell an argument like that, uh, you know, it shouldn't be in politics. I think it's, it's worth taking the electorate with you. And that's what I think they're looking for right now. Um, but it's getting harder and harder. The arteries have hardened on these positions. Nobody wants to admit something different. They don't want to admit they made a mistake. I mean, by Morrison today saying we're going to ditch the neg, he's sort of implicitly admitting that the big kerfuffle we just had about leadership was because of energy policy. It had nothing to do with energy policy. It was all about revenge, driven by Tony Abbott, and ego, driven by Dutton. And Tony convinced Dutton that, you know, mate, you could be Prime Minister, <laughs> right? And Button, Dutton says, yeah, that's a good idea. I believe in myself, you know, like <laughs> way out of his depth. But Tony's strategy was clear. He wanted to not only bring down Malcolm, he wanted to, to um, put Dutton up as a bit of a you know, stalking horse, a Trojan horse, knowing full well that once he was in Button's cabinet and Dutton wasn't performing, as you've already seen, he isn't performing. Said, oh, my God, I'll have to stand again, he would have said. You know, I'll get, the, <laughs> I'll get the job back. Now, that's what I think we've had to endure. It had nothing to do with energy policy. And for Morrison to come out and say today that, oh, well, we've got to ditch the neg, why? You have part of your support. You've got a handful of dissidents, insurgents in the party. Call them out. You know, question their, pen, their, their, their pre-selection. I, I would have said that the party should 
In the case of Abbott, as one of the insurgents, think about pulling his pre-selection. And as far as Dutton's concerned, make him accountable for his role as a Minister of Immigration, have an independent review of his conduct of that portfolio, and refer him to the High Court about his eligibility. That's not a political issue, that's a constitutional issue. You could clean that place up pretty quickly. <laughs> and that's what I think you should be doing. And I'm surprised that Morrison's giving a very clear statement of being quite a wholesome individual, you know, a, a hardline right, Christian, religious sort of person. Well, he's compromising that by backing Dutton. He's compromising it by not leading when, when there is an overwhelming uh, community support on an issue like climate. And, um, you know, he's sort of riding his own death knell in an electoral sense because the electorate is not going to forget what happened, you know. The one question they haven't been able to answer in the last few days in Parliament is, why did you replace Malcolm? <laughs> you know, the most the global media were ringing me up, what did Malcolm do wrong? And I said, well, he didn't do as much as people expect him to do, but he didn't really do anything wrong. And he was sort of line ball in the polls and always ahead as preferred Prime Minister. It's true they'd lost 70 news polls between him and Abbott, but that's not necessarily going to determine election outcome. He had a chance to lead and actually win the next election. So, you know, people are genuinely <laughs> un disbelieving in the way, what, what happened and the way it happened. And uh, we're surprised there was bullying and intimidation, and, you know, to get 43 signatures on a piece of paper. I wouldn't be surprised about anything. Create the circumstances like that. You can expect a race to the bottom. Mm. John, it seems, <clears throat> you've touched on it there, that the government is intent on making a virtue out of not tackling climate change or having much of an emissions policy. They think... They seem to think that is a winner. Do you think that the government can win the next election with a climate policy as it is? And do you see any hope anywhere on the conservative side of politics in Australia on climate policy? Well, I don't think they can win an election with climate where it is, but they don't have a climate policy anymore. They've just ditched it. So they're going to go to the election ditching it. It'll depend a lot on what Shorten does. Um, Shorten's obviously got a higher um, emissions reduction target um, and uh, they've been criticising him pretty heavily for that. And I think what, well, what Abbott would want to do, which has obviously influenced where they are, is to have a clear dis distinction between the government and the opposition where the government has no climate policy, don't think emissions reductions are important, don't think we should be giving them priority, should be getting somehow getting prices down without telling you how we're going to do it, just get poor the poor new minister for the energy out there saying, I'm going to bring down electricity prices. I'm, that's my job, I'm going to lower electricity prices. Don't know how many times he's said that in the last week or so. He never said how. He never said what he's going to do to achieve that outcome and at what cost. I think that is going to be a defining election issue. Uh, Shorten's not pure on it, though. He's still got a lot of detail to provide, I think, to back up his position. And um, I think he... Um, in particular, has to clear himself up on coal. I mean, he hasn't been prepared to rule out Adani, which staggered me after what Palisades did in Queensland. Look, a few years ago, uh, Jay Weatherall got a few of us, got Frank Jotso and I from here, and Anna Schwartz uh, from Climate Works, to do a study for him. He was joint chair of the, um, the um, global sub-government meeting, which was the Paris meeting uh, government to government meeting and then there's a sub-government meeting of cities and states and so on. He was chair of that and they wanted to sign a net zero emissions pledge for 2050, tougher than Paris, and he wanted to know whether that was reasonable in the case of South Australia. So what we did was develop quite a significant modelling process to show him that despite all the noise that was taking place and there would be some short-term transitional difficulties because on the intermittency problem with uh, wind and solar as they've been developed. But having said that, it could be 100% renewables by about 2035. And uh, we recommended that if he didn't, uh, if we didn't as a nation have an emissions trading scheme or an effective market price on carbon by then, then we suggested that South Australia consider joining the California scheme and selling their credits in there and getting billions of dollars to spend back here. And, uh, you know, these things can be done. They're not hard to do. And I think it's a tragedy, and that's what I think Bill's got to do. Bill's got to spread, spell out the detail of what he will do. 
uh, have a pure position on this, now that not just uh, try to sort of capitalise on the weaknesses as he perceives it of the government, but go for the principle of the issue, outline the, 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 in, a, in a detailed way the merits of what he wants to do, and that can't include coal. Well, I'm going to um, throw it over to you, ask a couple of questions. I know there's a, a mic uh, down the front here, so if you put your hand up, I'll try and get to as many of you as I can. I've got one right here to start with. You touched before on how our politicians are so far behind the, the people that they're supposed to be representing, and we can go back to the mm. Vietnam War, to abortion, to euthanasia, mm. to climate change, to all these different sorts of things. but. It seems that we have a, a habit of pre-selecting people in the major parties who don't represent mainstream views, who are, you know, Bob Santa Maria apostles or, or whatever, who are there for their own purposes. The major parties have a real problem. How do we fix it? How do we stop the major parties from putting up these people that people who've always voted Labor or Liberal are going to vote for because they don't know anything about politics. And they're, they're going to get elected even though they're not representing the people. Yeah, look, I think it's an important part of what's happened to politics in my, in my lifetime. I got involved in politics working for Phil Lynch in the middle 70s and then John Howard and Fraser and so on. Um, I'll just tell you a little story. When I, when I lost the election in 93, first day back in Parliament, going from the lower house to the upper house for the Governor-General to read the, you know, the State of the Nation address, Keating took me aside, pulled me aside behind one of the columns and said, I want to talk to you, which was a bit unnerving in itself, actually. <laughs> given, he said, no, I want to apologise to you because I called you some pretty terrible things and I just want you to know that I respect you. I, mean, I, you know, I criticise your policies, I criticise you, I just want you to know I respect you. And I could have lost you, in fact, I thought I had lost you. But you've got to understand one thing, he said, and here it comes. <laughs> he said, you've got to understand, John, that to me, politics is just a game. And I'll say I'll do whatever I have to to win. Now, up until that time, I'd always seen politics as pretty much a higher calling, that people would go into politics at a latter stage of their life after they'd made a contribution in whatever walk of life it was. You had a nice diversity of people coming in with all sorts of backgrounds, with a focus on making a contribution not playing a game. Uh, running government, I thought, was a pretty significant business. You know, it needed a lot of focused uh, expertise, uh, evidence-based policy, which I firmly believed good evidence-based policy would give you good politics with a relatively short lag. Since then, politics has just become increasingly short-term, increasingly negative, increasingly opportunistic and populist and so on. Now, in that process, both political parties have moved in favour of picking apparatchiks, people who fit their mould people who basically have never had a real job. Yeah, they might have come out of university politics, and you know what university politics is like, at least as I remember it. Today we'll go out and beat the hell out of the right, tomorrow we'll go out and beat the hell out of the left, then we'll go to the pub. You know, and that sort of balance. Um, some people just don't grow up from that. Christopher Bynes a good example, he still does that. <laughs> but you know, if, you, if you look at that, that sort of attitude, you're building people, bringing people in that just have particular skills in the end, They've only ever worked in the political process, either in a union or as a, a local government or a, a off, off, a staff of a minister or something. And they come in and the skills that they need to get pre-selection in today's parties are not necessarily that useful as a contributor to good government. You know, they're good at playing the game. They get in there, continue to play the game. Don't particularly stand for anything. Done all sorts of deals in most cases to get there. Uh, pretty constrained by some of the factions in terms of what they can do and say and go and where they can go and so on. And so when you see these people then elevated to the position of senior ministers who are running significant portfolios, multi-billion dollar portfolios with zero management experience, you've got to worry about where the system's going. And that's exactly what has happened. And uh, parties need to think about how they change that. And that's a truth on both sides. You've got to think about bringing in people with reputations, with contributions to make, with whatever, rather than just... And, and you want a good mix of people. And you certainly need more women on both sides, even though the Labor Party does better than the Liberal Party. We still don't even have a gender balance 
let alone a representation of, of, of an ethnic balance, for example, representative of the broader Australian community. There's a lot of thinking to be done in politics which doesn't get done because it's a short-term game. It's almost who can win the evening news with a soundbite or some sort of stunt during the day and tomorrow we'll move on to another issue, another location and we won't worry about what we said yesterday. And that's, that's demeaned the whole process. So I think it's a very big challenge for politics in this country. I know there are a lot of weaknesses of the American system, apart from Donald Trump and those sort of manifestations that have emerged out of it, but they do have a couple of features of their political process which we shouldn't lose sight of. One is that a Congress member or senator can actually have a full successful career never being part of the executive never being in the executive of government. They can make a very significant contribution on behalf of their constituency or their fields of interest, simply as a Congress, as a member of the Congress, as a member of the Senate. And the other thing is, of course, that the cabinet doesn't need to be elected. So you have, with some, you know, it does get beaten around from time to time, as we've seen with Trump, but um, it, you can bring in people who are experts in those 12 portfolios and make a substantial contribution. They're not beholden to a political process, not beholden to, to um, you know, a, a pre-selection process or a factional influence or whatever. They have to stand uh, election, if you like. They have to be um, approved by, by the Congress. But um, you, know, they, you can bring in the right people and you can get very good people. I never forget Ronald Reagan, one of his earlier statements, you know, where he tried to put in place a pretty effective team of, uh, for his cabinet. And he said, now I want you to keep me fully informed. He said, I want you to come to me any time of the day or night, uh, even if, uh, you know, in, in, in my office, for example, and even if I'm asleep, I want you to wake me up. And that was an example of the extent to which they delegate the running of the executive to people who know what they're doing. And we don't have that. And that's really a major weakness of our political process, I think. And I've got one here, and then there's... See one at the, see one at the back afterwards, Hannah. So. If, if there's a good independent candidate in Wentworth with a, good in, with a good renewable energy policy, will you campaign on their behalf? I might have to. <laughs> you find them. You know, I, uh, people have suggested you should go back, John. Now, how stupid do I look, right? <laughs> <laughs> Could I possibly contemplate going back into that mire? I mean, it was tough enough when you were there. But I do think it's uh, right for a good independent candidate. And there are some being rumoured. We'll see whether they emerge. But um, I have appeared in some of the uh, uh, campaign meetings. I did a couple of climate events in uh, Turnbull, when Turnbull was uh, running for the uh, election last time in that seat, big Paddington Town Hall meetings. People were trying to get commitments out of Turnbull to uh, you know, net zero emissions or, or uh, emissions reduction strategies, uh, focus on renewables. We did have a nice meeting amongst ourselves. It never had any impact on him. There's <laughs> <laughs> a woman at the back there, Hannah, did you? Yeah, um, great. I know that you don't want to go back into politics, but would you consider um, establishing something that is conservatives for climate change um, so that it would actually give voice to people within the Liberal Party who do actually believe in climate change rather than this ridiculous notion that we've got at the moment? Yeah, there is a basic issue here as to whether some of those people want to be led. Um, you know, they've got so concerned about their positions. Uh, look, I'm surprised. You know, I look at the Liberal Party today and I, I say, OK, what's, what's the succession plan? <laughs> you know, who's going to come through as a leader? And it's probably largely true of the Labor Party too. You take, up the top, take, take out the top couple. Okay, some quite good people lower down, but none of them are taking any political risks. None of them are prepared to make a stand. And I would have thought in the current environment there's some potential for some of those people to make a stand. And, uh, you know, I'm surprised that Angus Taylor, for example, who's got the energy portfolio, given his background with Port Jackson Partners and some of the things he said about pricing carbon and other things in his past, 
that he might have actually seized this opportunity to just sort of lead the sort of movement that you're talking about. But no, he spent his entire time saying how he's going to lower power prices without telling you how he's going to do it. And his job is to lower power prices. They don't take risks. And um, you do need to take risks in politics. You need to stand for something and be prepared to defend that position. Uh, this whole issue of values and beliefs and um, uh, motivations and so on has been lost. It's, not a, it's no longer really a contest of ideas. It's no longer really a contest of values. Ideology is a media, meaningless word, I think, when it comes to issues like this. So I don't think climate is an ideological issue. And it's easy to bag it as an ideological issue and somebody's extreme green left juice and, you know, gone mad sort of stuff, um, which they say. But it's not ideological. Uh, it's science. Science tells us in a pretty clear-cut way. And none, you know, most people aren't climate scientists. How do we know the planet's warming? You can't look out the window and see it warming. You don't experience it directly, although you know the temperatures have been rising and we've had a few hot days, hot summers, more intense. Uh, you know, go back to the original forecast of climate scientists, there'd be more extreme weather events occurring with greater frequency and intensity. Definitely happened. Okay, but we, that's about what we know as non-climate scientists. We have to rely on the science. And yet, you know, part of the debate, uh, particularly in the Abbott era, when he was trying to close down the renewable energy target, was some pretty vindictive attacks on scientists, death threats on some scientists for speaking out. Uh, drove a lot of those people to be quiet, to not participate actively in the debate. And one of the things that worries me is that everybody has a role to play in this sort of issue. And, um, you know, in my day, of course, we'd go and march in the street about Vietnam War. You know, we'd carry on a treat about it, and uh, there was some pretty extreme behaviour in there to make a point. People don't march in the street anymore. They can march, though, on the social media. They can do an enormous amount of campaigning on social media, cut through all the, you know, the false, <laughs> fake news on Twitter and, and Facebook, but you can use that mechanism to really mount a very substantial campaign. And that's where I think I, a lot of leadership will come. And I would say that the biggest challenge right now is to younger Australians who actually have the facility to use that medium better than most. And uh, they don't want to underestimate how, just how powerful they can be. A good example from the UK in recent days was over the Brexit vote. I remember when the Brexit vote was being taken, I rang one of my friends in London and said, uh, you know, how's it going to go? Oh, 60-40. Well, 60-40 to, to stay. And he was right. London voted 60-40. Mm -hmm. The rest of the country voted pretty much the other way, enough to give a margin in favour of, of exiting the European community. And uh, that was because basically young people didn't vote. Older people who, who were very protective of what they had and were very concerned about the pressures coming from immigration, even though that whole debate was exaggerated, and the cost of Brussels were factors that actually brought the old people out. And what I was impressed about was then when Cameron did the right thing, I guess, and stood down, having called the referendum and lost, Theresa May took over and she said, no, now I need to get a 100-seat majority to get the strength, the mandate to take on the Europeans in these negotiations about our exit. And this time the youth decided to vote. <laughs> and she ended up with a minority government. And that's always been a good example to me of the power that the young people can muster in a, on an issue as important as, as, as that in the case of the UK. And I'd say in this case, the climate change with the government kicking the problem down to the next generation and the generation after, I mean, if you should start thinking as a young person about what sort of task you're going to have if we don't cut emissions. I mean, we have still struggling with this 5% cut in emissions by 2020, 20 years after I saw, thought we were going to make real progress on this issue, and no pathway to get to 2030. You know, and it's not... I've often heard the argument in the Liberal Party, well, we don't need to do it today, or we won't do it until one of our trading partners moves. We won't do it until China and India start to adjust. Well, they're actually doing a hell of a lot more than we are, and they're doing a lot faster than we are. And, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the um, argument has been, has been lost. Uh, and you can't leave it to 2029 and then go and change things. 
Now, this is a change that requires a repositioning of our entire society and the way we live, the way we use energy, the way we generate energy, the way we you know, drive and uh, how we f fuel our cars and all the other elements of, of um, emissions in this country. It's a community-wide responsibility to do that and we need to pull together to do that. And to the extent we don't do that, you won't wake up on 2029 and try and fix it. Because you're changing behaviour over a long period of time, you're changing the industrial base of the system over a long period of time. And so to hear that argument in the Liberal Party, let's wait to 2029 or 2049, it just gives me, it really gives me the shits, to be honest, to hear that sort of argument when it's grossly irresponsible and the next generation and the one after that and the one after that is going to have a much bigger task with a much greater pressure, and uh, they start to see the consequences of, of not dealing with the issue. One of the things that comes out in this survey today was not just the overwhelming support, nearly three quarters of people want the decisive action on climate, but they quickly link it to the fact that there's a, a drought, that there's a, the, the crop productions are going down, food supplies falling into question, bushfires are becoming more intense, the reef is at greater risk. People understand the risks that are being taken. It's grossly irresponsible of government not to recognise the concern that people have about that. And to kick that to your kids and their kids to solve is just grossly irresponsible. It's intergenerational theft. Uh, Hannah, where are you? Well, there's one, there's a woman right here with a hand up here. Not far from you. Hi, how are you going? Um, I just have a quick question about how we introduce climate policy without marginalising people, particularly those who um, worked during the mining boom in the primary or secondary, as primary or secondary benefactors from the mining boom, and we're trying to sell this kind of whole climate idea. How do we not? How do we make sure that we don't push them further to the right for, into like one nation, particularly in rural and regional like Queensland, through that policy? Yeah. I think I got the question, um, which is how do we not marginalise people? And I wasn't sure where you said those people were. People in the coal industry were talking. Well, or? regional Australia, one <coughs> nation voters. Yeah, OK. But regional Australia is a good example of where the national parties missed some great opportunities in climate change. You know, and I can give you a couple of specific examples. I had a debate once on radio with a fellow named Barnaby Joyce who um, didn't understand anything about soil carbon because one of the things that the farming community can do quite easily by simply changing their farming techniques, you know, using organic fertilisers rather than chemical fertilisers, changing the tilling of the soil, land clearing and so on, they can dramatically improve and quite quickly, the carbon content of the soil. And to the extent that they do that, they would generate a carbon credit. And uh, the government could buy those credits and uh, sell them off into the international market or whatever. A massive source of additional income to a farmer by simply changing what they do, being more responsible about what they do. So they, don't, aren't, they aren't necessarily going to be marginalised. I noticed one of the things in our survey here today is the way the attitudes in the National Party and the attitudes in One Nation are changing and changing quite dramatically. The extent to which people are climate deniers or climate sceptics is falling and falling quite fast. They're starting to recognise the benefits to them that can flow from something like that. Another issue which is very big in regional Australia is waste. And the fact that you can t now, there's technologies in Australia, to turn that waste into something that is climate sympathetic, whether it's green diesel or whether it's uh, extracting the methane. Now, years ago, and back in 2000, we built a household garbage recycling plant at Eastern Creek. I convinced Bob Carr that, look, you know, why do you landfill our garbage? I mean, that's got to be the most barbaric practice, environmental practice, environmentally negative practice in the world. His answer was, well, I'm told it's, it's the least worst option. I said, what about if there's a technology option where you can take the garbage, sort it into paper, glass, plastic, metal and so on, and have technologies like aerobic and anaerobic digestion which would extract the methane gas. So what you're left with is something that's 99% organically pure. You can landfill it then if you want to. 
and you make income out of each of those streams as you pull, pull them out. So he gave us approval to build that plant. We built it very quickly at Eastern Creek on a landfill. So instead of the garbage going in the hole, right, it goes into the landfill, it goes into the plant, and that process is, uh, is adhered to. Now those possibilities are very significant in regional Australia and becoming more significant as we see the Chinese now not willing to import our garbage where we were getting a lot of it out of the way and so it becomes a real problem. Now the, the job creating possibilities, the investment possibilities of the simple application of proven technologies into regional Australia to, uh, to work in the direction of improving our climate uh, I think is just uh, is, is understated. And I noticed that I went to an event in Parliament House a few months ago, a bioenergy event, where both sides of politics stood up and said they were going to have a regional policy which included bioenergy. Now, bioenergy is an area that we, we can do pretty well in this country, uh, and I can say that from my own experience. So they, it's not just... OK, they might feel a bit marginalised in terms of their specific job, so part of it's the transition away from coal to other things. And, uh, you know, coal mining these days and other mining is not all that labour intensive. I mean, one of the things that Adani got into trouble with was to initially say, we'll create 14,000 jobs. And then a few weeks later doing an interview saying, well, you know, of course, we're going to have full mechanisation at the coal face, we're going to have driverless trains, we're going to, you know... And it was only 1,400 jobs. And... Um, the exaggeration there of those who might be marginalised was, was significant. So I think solutions exist and political leadership is about explaining to people what you're trying to do, why you're trying to do it, where there are transitional effects on some people rather than letting them be marginalised and forgotten and ignored. Part of the process of good policy is to actually deal with that transition may involve retraining, it may involve relocation. You may have to spend some money to achieve the outcome. But I don't think you should shy away from that. And unfortunately in policy today, you don't see too much policy design and development work being done. A lot of what gets done, gets done at the last minute to announce in a budget or in the context of an election, and not thought through. Best example of that in the context of the GFC was the pink bat. Sold by Rudd as a very significant environmental initiative. Right? with no regulatory structure around it at all, uh, by a department that had never delivered a service ever. And um, so it wasn't surprising that uh, from an initial number of about 200 pink bat installers, you ended up with 8,500 in about three months. Anyone with a ute and a ladder that could get hold of a pink bat was in business. And they were pulling money out of it faster than you can imagine. Uh, that didn't end up being a successful program simply because it wasn't designed properly. And as we know, some people lost their lives in that process. Very significant downside to very bad public policy. The intention was fine, get some money out the door. You might as well just put it in an envelope and post it to people. Quite frankly, would have done less damage. But, um, you know, that's where I think governments need to think about it. And you honestly say, look, some people will feel marginalised in this. We're going to deal with that rather than just uh, pushing on as if it's not going to happen. So I do think that, the, you know, it's all about how you develop, design and implement a policy. And there's not enough thought goes into that. We don't even have an assessment done in the annual budget of programs that were introduced the year before as to whether they're working. Are they cost effective? Are they delivering the outcomes we think? You know, pretty simple stuff. I launched a paper the other night at uh, University of New South Wales where they have developed a social um, return accounting structure so that you can actually put alternative government expenditures on a similar basis. Use cost-benefit analysis of a physical project, for example, the inland rail, freight rail, for example, or something, Badgerys Creek, you can do a good cost-benefit analysis. But in other areas of public policy, like the NBN or the NDIS, it's a lot harder. This is a, pr a framework that has been developed to get governments to think about that. So these, these issues can be dealt with, but uh, unfortunately they, you know, they... Um, tend to get neglected in the rush to the, to the election. And, um, you know, people do feel genuinely marginalised. So I think you admit that they, some people will feel disaffected and you intend to deal with them as part of the transition process. You'll get a different political result. But if you just ignore them and, you know, push them aside, don't compensate them in some sense, don't uh, facilitate the transition, you'll pay a price electorally. 
Please thank John Hewson. Our time is up.